In 55 BC, Julius Caesar launched a series of wars of aggression against Gaul, and while invading Gaul, he crossed the channel twice and set foot on the land of Britain. Julius Caesar was only the beginning of the Roman invasion of Britain. In 43, the Roman Emperor Claudius crossed the channel along the route of Julius Caesar, conquered a large part of Britain, and founded a province. In 117, when Hadrian became Roman Emperor, the Celts frequently attacked northern Britain, and many of the people conquered by Rome rebelled, including those in Egypt, Palestine, Libya. The strong military pressure forced Rome to abandon some territories and forts in the north of Britain and build the wall to defend Britain against the Celts. In the area south of the wall, Latin towns were established, and the commodity economy and trade were very developed. The Romans and the locals gradually integrated and formed the Romano-British nation. But the prosperity didn't last long. At the end of the 4th century, the Roman Empire gradually collapsed and fell, and Britain, as a province of the empire, couldn't escape this fate either. The city began to decline and, most importantly, the Roman legions began to withdraw from Britain, leaving it defenseless. To the north, the Picts, a branch of the Celts, frequently plundered the rich southern regions. To the west, the Scots came across the sea and settled in large areas. To the east, the Saxons, in collusion with men serving in the army, prepared to sack Britain's coastal towns. Among the invaders were Picts from the north, who liked to paint their bodies with indigo pigment, Picts meaning those who paint their bodies. Picts claimed that his ancestor, Cruthen, came from the Scythians to northern Britain and ruled for 100 years. After his death, the land was divided among his seven sons, creating the seven Picts kingdoms, and in reality, there were indeed seven main Picts tribes, each with a king, and two high kings over the seven kings, each ruling over four tribes in the south of Fife, and three tribes in the north, and sometimes a high king over all seven tribes. In 449, a British king known as Vortigern was troubled by the looting of Picts. Vortigern had no effective way of dealing with it, so what to do? He came up with what he thought was a very good solution, and that was to hire Germanic peoples on the continent and have them fight for him. Vortigern was so happy with his wisdom that he immediately sent an envoy across the sea to invite the Germanic tribal leaders, not realizing that he had opened Pandora's box with his own hands. Vortigern's messengers did not disappoint him. Hengist and Horsa, leaders of the Angles and Jutes, answered his call and arrived in Britain with three ships of warriors. Vortigern welcomed them with open arms and allowed Angles to live in Vortigern's palace as a court guard. Soon after, a powerful Picts army entered the northern part of Vortigern to pillage, and Vortigern immediately rallied Britain and Angles to fight against the Picts. And the soldiers led by Hengist and Horsa fought bravely and defeated the Picts without the need of Britain's men. Angles' bravery pleased Vortigern so much that he rewarded them with much of the northern lands as a barrier against the Picts, and Hengist accepted the reward on the condition that he would send a letter to his own people, asking them to cross the sea to help Vortigern as well. In the letter he sent to the mainland, Hengist tore off his mask of disguise and told the Germanic people in his homeland that Britain was fertile and rich in food, but its people were very cowardly, so with enough troops, they could drive out the British here and take over the land. The Teutons who received the letter were so encouraged that the Saxons, in addition to Hengist's kinsmen, joined in the venture. They sent eighteen ships full of their best warriors to Britain, taking Hengist's beautiful daughter Rowena with them. Seeing the large number of Germanic warriors arriving, Vortigern is afraid that the powerful Germanic people will be out of his control. However, when he sees the beautiful Rowena, all this disappears and he falls in love with her. At a banquet, Vortigern offers to make Rowena his wife, and Hengist readily agrees, though he does make demands. With enemies everywhere in the north and an unwillingness of the people to obey his command, Hengist asks Vortigern to relocate him to Kent on the southern coast. Attracted by the beautiful Rowena, Vortigern agrees to Hengist's request. Hengist and Horsa took their people to Kent, 
fertile land and close to the mainland, Hengist once again called for reinforcements, this time coming with a force of 300 ships. Hengist begins to massacre the Britons, the defenseless Vortigern suffers a crushing defeat and his palace in Canterbury is sacked. The cruelty of the Anglo-Saxons in Britain provoked a popular revolt, and they took up arms and went to war. And in 455 there was a fierce battle between the Anglo-Saxons and the Britons at Aylesford, and although the Anglo-Saxons were victorious, Horsa, the chief, died on the battlefield, and a large number of soldiers were killed or wounded. Hengist did not want to fight the Britons head-on anymore. He claimed that he wanted to make peace with the Britons, inviting their chiefs to negotiate with him with the stipulation that neither side would carry weapons. Vortigern believed Hengist, and he brought 300 nobles to the negotiations unarmed, while Hengist had his men secretly hide short swords on their person. While waiting for the banquet to get underway, the Saxons suddenly attacked and killed all the Britons. After Hengist's plot was successful, he led the Anglo-Saxons to continue their attack on Britain, and without a leader, the Britons were completely driven out of Kent, and Hengist established the Kingdom of Kent on the land. With Hengist's success in Britain, other Anglo-Saxons came to Britain by ship, and the destruction of the Britons seemed to be fast approaching. But God had not abandoned the people. At the time of the massacre of the nobles of Britain by Hengist, two sons of Aurelianus did not attend the feast because of their youth. Their names were Ambrosius Aurelianus and Euther Pendragon, the uncle and father of the legendary King Arthur. Much is written about Ambrosius in De Exidio et Conquesta Britanniae, while Euther's name is mentioned many times in ancient Welsh poetry. Although the story of King Arthur is fictional, archaeological discoveries have shown that there was indeed a British leader who defeated the Saxons and put a pause on Saxon aggression for half a century, and that this leader was very close to Ambrosius and Euther, but no name is known, so for the time being, the British leader will be referred to as Arthur. Ambrosius' ancestor once wore a purple robe, which was a privilege of Roman emperors, so it is assumed that Ambrosius was probably related to a Roman emperor. To be sure, Ambrosius and Euther were indeed born into a very noble family. After their father was killed, the two brothers fled westward back to his father's stronghold of Bath, a city on the River Avon in what is now Somerset. Because of Bath's remote location, it was not invaded by the Anglo-Saxons, and many refugees from the east fled here, increasing the population instead. When Ambrosius arrived in Bath, he immediately selected soldiers, trained them in the manner of the Roman army, and chose from among them men of valor to form his own guard, called Combrogi. This was a small but valiant guard, similar to the cavalry of the Roman Empire. Euther did not travel with Ambrosius to Bath, but continued west to Tintagel, a castle by the sea, on a small island to the north of Cornwall, connected to the land only by a bridge, making it an easy place to defend. A story of Euther's activities here is recounted in History of the Kings of Britain. At a feast, Euther falls in love with Igraine, wife of the Duke of Cornwall, ruler of Tintagel, and he begs the wizard Merlin to turn him into a duke. While the duke was away, he walked into the castle to meet Igraine and impregnated her, the child being King Arthur. This legend is of course not true, but one can guess the truth of history, Euther arrived in Cornwall, most likely relying on his bravery to become a military elite. When the ruler died in battle, he married the ruler's wife and became the master of Tintagel shortly after his son Arthur was born. While Ambrosius and Euther were developing their power, the Anglo-Saxons' invasions did not stop, and Hengist and Horse's son Oist continued to attack Britain. In 477, a Saxon's chieftain named Eld came to Britain with his three sons Simon, Lensing, and Chissa and landed off the coast of what is now Sussex, naming the landing place after his oldest son Simon as Simonshore, meaning Simon's Beach, and founded the Kingdom of Sussex. When the aged Hengist died in 488, the king had no descendants and Horse's son Oist became heir to the kingdom. In 493, El gathered an army and aimed at Bath, the center of British resistance. 
By this time, both Ambrosius and Uther had died, and Arthur, who had reached adulthood, united the two separate kingdoms. At the time of El's advance, Arthur does not appear to have been near Bath, possibly fighting Picts in the north. Upon receiving news of the enemy invasion, he returned immediately. Since the River Avon had several shallows to cross, Arthur was unsure where El would cross, so he gathered his forces and waited for the Saxons at one of the shallows. El did not cross the river from the shallows where Arthur had ambushed him. He didn't even know that Arthur had returned, so he rushed straight for Bath. In the Battle of Bath, the stone walls built by the Romans stood the test of time, and the Saxons were still unable to enter Bath after two days of attack. By the third day, Arthur appeared on the horizon with his cavalry. Seeing the cavalry of the Britons, El knew that he could not retreat, as the Saxons were already in some panic, and if he fled, the whole army would surely be instantly dispersed. He gathered his troops and retreated to a hill called Badon Hill. Arthur rallied his troops both inside and outside the town and launched a fierce attack on the Saxons, who finally could not hold out under the fierce charge of Britain's cavalry and were routed by evening. El was lucky enough to escape back to Sussex, where he remained king for another 21 years, never daring to attack Bath again in his life.